Okay, what do you want to do to get into solar power and you're not really sure what you need to do, how to figure it out, where to start, or anything. So this is your starting point. And I'm going to help you figure out everything that you need to do uh, the, so that you'll know how much you need to get in the way of batteries, solar panels, how big a charger you need, all of these types of things. We're going to talk about some pretty complicated sounding formulas if you're if you're not at least a lay person in the electrical field but the formulas I'm gonna give you you simply plug in the numbers and you'll get the figures that you need as long as you depend on these formulas it'll it'll tell you exactly what you need in the way of batteries and that type of thing uh, so let's get started first we're gonna do a little bit of overview on everything uh, there's three types of systems that are in use. One of them is the utility grid enter type. That system is a system where you're basically using the power company as your battery. Uh, you're, you've got maybe some solar panels or a wind generator. You feed the power into the utility and then whenever there's no sun or wind, you're taking power back from the utility company. Uh, uh, so they charge you for that. You're basically just reducing your electric bill we're not even going to discuss that here because it's outside the scope of what I think anyone should do and I think those types of systems are for people that, that got more money than sense or something. I don't know. I, I, I haven't been sold on it. Uh, the other thing that we're going to talk about is a grid intertype backup. This is where you'll have batteries and they're sort of in place of a gas generator. Uh, it's a good first step. Uh, getting into alternative energy it lets you get a good feel of batteries how they operate uh, in this system you have batteries that are charged off the electrical grid when the power goes out the inverter kicks in keeps your freezer refrigerator the really important things in your house keeps those going then the next type of system that we have is what I call the alternative energy backup or assist system and that's where you use solar, wind, thermal, something to give uh, extra electricity to the batteries. So you're not charging them from the power grid. You're actually charging them from uh, an alternative energy source rather than the grid. Uh, same type of scenario. It's going to run your refrigerator, freezer, things that are important to you when the power goes out. Uh, but you're also gonna, going to run some things on this that... Uh, will be day-to-day -day things like um, so you might run a refrigerator on it all the time or lights or air compressor for your garage something to that effect um, sort of get get your feet wet it's a good next step when you're moving into solar power then the uh, final system is standalone that's the system that I'm on I've, I've run standalone for the last uh, 25 30 years I like it the best. I feel more, uh, well, I don't want to use the word invulnerable, but, but I feel a lot more secure on a standalone system. I have uh, absolutely no bills. I feel like I'm in charge of my own future, and it's just a great feeling. It's, it's like having all your debts paid off. Uh, so we'll, we'll go into that one, too. But all of these uh, last three systems that I talked about, uh, they're they're uh, uh, all going to be applicable in these formulas that we're going to use. Now the deciding factors for a system uh, that a person would choose to go with a, an alternative energy system is going to be uh, for a backup for blackouts only, emergency situations. You're not planning to really live on it, but you, wanna get it, you want it to get you through a tight spot for a few days or a couple of weeks or something like that. Or you want to use it for an assistance type thing. You want to use it to really lower your bills, but also offer a level of independence if you need it for that. And then, of course, uh, some people just want to be completely free of utilities. And I fit into that category. Uh, the reasons that people do this uh, can be for green or environmental concerns. Uh, all you tree huggers out there are digging this because... You want to save the planet, and that's cool by me. Uh, another reason for it is costs, and that was definitely one of the reasons I got into it. The power company wanted $11,000 for me to tie into their power 
and that was more than I was willing to pay, so I took that money and I went completely standalone. Uh, another reason is independence. Uh, that's my primary motivating factor. I want to be independent, and I don't want to have to worry about paying somebody a bill. If I lose my job, how am I going to pay the, the bill? Uh, if the power company, for whatever reason, takes a big hit and they're not going to be able to get me power for a couple of months because I'm in a rural area, uh, I, I just like being independent from all those worries. Now the areas of study before we start designing our system is you need to look at your willingness for life change to have uh, an alternative means of electricity. Uh, just like you don't wash your car before a rainstorm, you check the weather and if it looks like it's going to rain, you don't go out and wash your car. Same thing with a solar powered or wind powered system. You don't iron your clothes when it's getting dark. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just a, a life change. You just change your way of living to accommodate the power system and the way that it's running and you'll be a whole lot better off. That is probably 90% of being able to live successfully completely off the grid. Now of course if you're wanting to uh, design a backup system you don't really need to take that into consideration as much. Um, also if you're willing to use battery operated alarm clocks instead of the alarm, that nice fancy LED alarm clock you've got sitting next to your bed uh, that'll save, believe it or not, enough power that it can make or break uh, whether or not you can go completely independent. And I'm not talking about just the clock, but all the things of that nature. Uh, you can also consider the use of timers for your uh, chargers, say for our cell phones and our Androids and MP3 player and drills and all these cordless things that we charge with. We plug all of those into a power strip. The power strip's plugged into a timer. The timer turns on at about 9 o'clock in the morning, and it turns off about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, that way we don't have to worry about plugging and unplugging chargers into the outlets. And uh, A timer's only going to use 1 or 2 watts, where all those chargers combined up are going to pull 30, 40 watts pretty easy. So timers and that type of thing. We even use a timer on our refrigerator. Uh, we have it turn the refrigerator off at 9 o'clock at night and it comes back on again at 1 in the morning. Runs for an hour and a half and then it shuts back off until 6 in the morning and it comes back on. And that saves a lot of electricity too. Some people don't want to get that extreme. That's fine. Whatever fits for you. The another area that you need to study is what your current consumption of energy is. That's, uh, that's the whole basis for even going to an alternative energy. Are you using so much power that you can't even think about going to an alternative uh, energy source? Or uh, are you using surprisingly little enough already that you could just slide over to it? Everyone's different. That's the reason you can't just uh, say, hey Steve, how much uh, batteries do I need? How much solar panels do I need? Everyone's requirements are different, depending on the size of your home, the size of your family, all kinds of things like that. Um, another thing that you want to study are the things that you can change to a lower power consumption. That includes if you've got an old tube type TV or an old projection TV. Uh, LED TVs draw the lowest power these days. Uh, tier 3 Energy Star rated refrigerators use uh, sometimes 90% less electricity than uh, their non-Energy Star counterparts. So uh, those are things to think about. LED lighting in your home will immediately reduce your power requirements noticeably on your bill. Another thing you want to study is where you're going to have your uh, solar panels or wind generator. You'll need to consider the average sun hours you have available during the, the day or your average wind speed during the day. Uh, you really want to look at structures, trees, buildings that are in the area. If you're going to stick a wind generator in your backyard, you've got to have it considerably higher than the highest thing within 300 feet. Uh, if it's solar panels, you don't want any trees or buildings or mountains or anything like that. If, if you get a corner of your panels shaded, 
it restricts the output of the entire array down to whatever that shaded cell is putting out. Uh, so you want to have those as much in the sun as possible. If you say, well, I, my panels are only shaded half the day, we are only getting half the power. That's the bottom line. So you really want to look at where you're locating everything. Sun hours are going to be greatly impacted by your distance from the equator. You have uh, longer nights in the winter time, uh, the further from the equator you are. The climate, uh, if you have a lot of rain and a lot of snow where you live, uh, the cloud cover is going to affect uh, the amount of sun that you have. So uh, you want to really take these things into hard consideration uh, before you really jump off into this because if you live near the Arctic uh, region and uh, you'd have to have so many solar panels and such a huge battery bank in the winter time, it's practically not worth it. Um, so those are things you want to consider. So now let's go into an overview of uh, uh, sizing up a system. So for grid intertie backup, you only need an inverter and charger for the batteries. The size of batteries for the amount of time you expect for the power to be out. Draining the batteries to no more than 50% discharge. The reason for that is if you go down to 80 or 90% discharge, you're pretty much killing your batteries already. They're, they're going to be useless really fast. My rule of thumb is never go below a 50% discharge cycle. Now an emergency situation during a power outage and it's emergency and you're needing heat in your house and your gas furnace needs electricity for the solenoid to kick on, in times like that I'll run them flat. That's the bottom line. But when you're calculating you want to never discharge your batteries ever more than 50%. That's your worst case scenario. I shoot for a 5 to 10 percent discharge rate per day. Uh, you should have an, in an, an inverter that charges the batteries from the line power and automatically switches over during a power outage and it should be big enough to handle the surge of any appliances using it. If you're going to run an air compressor on it and your air compressor says that it pulls 12 amps but it surges 18 amps, your inverter needs to handle that. Again, don't worry about uh, amps, volts, watts, all that stuff. I'm going to give you the formulas. You just plug them in and it works. Trust me, it's very easy. So your, your alternative energy backup and assist in this overview, you're going to design it the same as the grid intertie backup except now you add photovoltaic panels and a charge controller. You'll also run some items on it constantly such as lights, uh, an efficient freezer or an efficient TV, that type of thing. Uh, when you first set up your system, keep a close eye on your voltage. If you see the voltage creeping lower each morning from the previous morning, start taking loads off of that until you get a good voltage that's no more than a 10% discharge each day. You'll need to look at getting a bigger battery if you have to pull a lot of loads off. Keep a close eye on your voltage also during cloudy and windless days. If your voltage has trouble getting at least to the float voltage, and that'll be in the battery specifications. Again, don't worry about that right now. But if, you ha if the voltage during the day or during the wind has trouble getting to at least the float voltage, you'll have to start pulling off the loads until your uh, voltage can get up to that float level. Don't worry about voltage levels now. We'll discuss all that later. For standalone systems, you'll design a system that will handle your needs for perhaps a week with little to no charging without discharging your batteries no more than 50% by the time you get a good charge back on them. That's the goal that you want to shoot for. You'll also get the most PV panels that you can afford and find other places to store the energy other than your batteries. This is when you get frugal and lifestyle changes are imposed to make it work. In this case, you have no utility to go back to other than perhaps a generator, if you can get gas for it. During natural disasters, if the electricity is out, then there is no electricity to run the gas pumps, read your card, or even run the cash register. Standalone Systems has always given me the highest level of security for my family and truly a weight off my shoulders when the turds fly. Since we live this way already, our lifestyle changes have already become second nature and it's just the way of life. Again, if you don't go out and wash your car before a rainstorm. My wife doesn't iron or wash clothes when it's starting to get dark. 
Uh, she doesn't wash her own clothes if it's getting cloudy and fixing the rain. Same kind of philosophy. Um, we, we don't drive to the river on an empty tank of gas. We fill up the tank first. We don't wash clothes when it's cloudy. We wash when it's nice and sunny and then hang the clothes on the line. Being self-reliant is as good as it gets, my friend. I know because we live it. Okay, so now let's start by looking at your consumption. This is where we get into the meat of things. You want to buy a kilowatt meter, and it's kill a watt meter from the hardware store. Radio Shack and Home Depot both carry these, I know, and they're around 30 bucks. You'll buy that, plug it into the wall, and then plug your refrigerator into it. Leave it on for a few days with normal use, and at the end of a couple of days, record the kilowatt hours it is used. That's, that'll be the little pinkish red button off to the far right. And you hit it once, and it'll give you the number of kilowatt hours that it's used. Then you'll get the number of hours that the appliance has been running through it. The, you just hit that pink red button again, and then it'll show you the hours and minutes that it's been running. Now you'll want to divide the kilowatt hours by the number of hours that it's been running, and multiply that by 24. This is the appliance's average kilowatt consumption per day. In our example, we've used 1.75 or excuse me, 1.57 kilowatt hours and it is run for 42 hours 51 minutes. I always round up to the next half hour so that way I know that I'm getting at least what I need to get. So in this example, we'll use 43 hours. So we divide our 1.57 kilowatt hours by 43 and that gives us 0 0.0365 multiply that by 24 because there's 24 hours in a day that gives 0.876 kilowatt hours per day write that number down on a paper and do this with all your appliances that need to be constantly plugged in items like toasters and microwaves can be guesstimated like this Look at the tag on the appliance to see how many watts it draws. If your toaster says it draws 1500 watts, and you know that you use it for an average of about 5 minutes per day, you can figure it like this. Multiply the device's wattage by .001. That gives the kilowatts that it uses. 1.5 kilowatts is this device's consumption. Divide the number of minutes per day you use it by 1,440. Multiply your number by its kilowatt consumption. In this case, it's 0 .0034722. And that was our number. That's our five minutes divided by 1,440. That's 0 .0034722. We multiply that times the consumption of the device. In this case, 1.5 kilowatts. Once we've done that multiplication, that gives us 0 .0052 kilowatt hours per day. Now, some people are going to say, man, you did all that work just to find out that thing doesn't even use uh, but 5 watt hours a day. Well, that's true, but all those watt hours add up. You want to keep track of all these kilowatt hours per day that each item that you have uses. Some appliances that you look at are going to give the amps instead of the wattage that it uses. This is easy. Just multiply the amps by the volts to get the watts. So let's say that your air compressor says that it uses 10.5 amps and the voltage rating on it is 120 volts. So now you'll multiply the 10.5 times 120 and that gives you 1260 watts. Now you can plug those watts usage into the formulas that we've just discussed. This might seem small, but after you've added up a hundred of these little items around your house, you're going to find that you've just found over a kilowatt hours in stuff that you've never even thought that much about. Add up the power consumption of everything that you're going to use in your home on this power system. Just as a suggestion, if your refrigerator uses over one and a half kilowatt hours per day, I would consider replacing it. Uh, if it's got incandescent light bulbs in it like mine did, I replaced them all with LED bulbs. 
Uh, if you've got a 32 inch TV that uses any more than 150 watts, consider replacing it with an LED model. They only use 55 watts. You can immediately cut your lighting costs by over 80% if you replace all of your incandescent lights with LED lights. Or you can cut your lighting costs by another 50% if you replace your CFLs with LEDs. I replaced a 55 watt halogen floodlight with a 10 watt floodlight that's every bit as good as that old halogen lamp I used. And after you've determined what your power needs are, now you're ready to go out and figure out how big of a battery bank you need. So we'll have a look at calculating for batteries and inverters next week. And in the meantime, go get those kilowatt meters and start seeing how much power you use. Have a great week. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.